2021, Bitcoin, NFTs, tokens, DeFi, all the jargon that dominated 2021 when it comes to digital assets and the decentralization of finance. Is there something real behind all this? Is it hype? Perhaps there are signs of what the future might look like already. You're listening to the Business Extra podcast coming from the National in Abu Dhabi. I'm Mustafa Al Rawi, Assistant Editor in Chief. If you like this show, please do subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your audio content. With me is the National's Future Editor and co host, Kelsey Warner. Hi, Kelsey. Hey, Mustafa. As I was saying at the top, um, there's been a lot of buzz. A lot of anger, um, a lot of confusion. Mostly confusion. <laughs> um, about, about, about some of the developments in the digital economy. And buzzword bingo of 2021. Sort of the, as we round out this year, analysts are declaring the mainstreaming of cryptocurrencies. 2021 was the year that crypto went mainstream as we start to slow step our way to what some are predicting is Web 3.0, this long sought after, this long vaunted idea that we will give way from big tech, take power back from Google, Apple, Twitter, Facebook, and the like, and through the power of the blockchain, operate our own internet on our own. This idea that things will be decentralized. No one can own really anything except for crypto assets. So cryptocurrencies, the massive amount of money that was poured into crypto in 2021, an early sign of Web 3.0. Okay, well, you spoke to Y. Lum Kwok of the ADGM, Abu Dhabi Global Market, about this very subject. Let's listen to that now. I'm excited to talk to you about the future of money, the future of digital assets, and where ADGM sits in this new world order when it comes to assets. Can you talk a bit about your remit and what, what your goals are in the work that you do? So my focus is very much about licensing and authorizing financial services firms, uh, both in the traditional sector, as well as obviously in the new digital segment, right? So when we first started our journey in 2015, um, the term fintech was very, very new and probably not even existent. Um, But we had the amazing opportunity as a new financial center to reimagine the way we want to develop our rules and regulations to be ready for the digital economy of the future. So we were able to adopt a very blue sky approach to policy thinking, structuring our rules and regulations. And we recognize that fintech from day one, it's a very important part of the financial services sector uh, because the future of finance will be technology driven. Right? So we walked the talk by introducing the first rectory sandbox in this region that is catered to fintech innovators. And through the engagement with these fintech innovators, the idea is to help them navigate the regulatory requirements so that they can scale up their business and then comply with the regulatory requirements as they go along the way under the supervision, of course, of the regulators. And in that process and engagement, we also developed to become a more sophisticated regulator, knowing the business models, understanding their risks, and develop our own regulatory thinking on how to introduce their business models into the marketplace in a safe manner. So to date, we are pretty sophisticated in terms of having introduced a whole host of regulatory regimes to cater to a diverse range of uh, digital financial services, from digital banking to digital payments, digital assets to securities, robo-advisory, open finance frameworks, so and so forth. Okay, so when you opened your doors, it was a a big opportunity to create a regulatory environment from scratch for financial technology companies that up until this time have never existed before. This is a kind of a new world order for the financial services industry. So can you talk to me a bit about what sort of products and services you're seeing from these fintech companies that have come to ADGM in the last six years? I would say... A lot of the fintechs are driven by the underlying needs of the business and economy in this region. We do see payments and remittance uh, being one of the more disruptive space. Uh, And that's, of course, given the migrant population here, a lot of uh, demand is required in terms of uh, remittance services. And remittance, which traditionally is fairly expensive, dependent on a middleman, kind of a ripe for disruption space. Uh, Indeed, indeed. And 
in fact, a lot of the migrant population also tends to be underserved uh, from that perspective, uh, especially when it comes to even having a basic bank account. Um, so a lot of the fintechs that we see started off serving this space. Another segment that we are seeing has to do with the lending space. And of course, um, the lending, it's not just to peer-to-peer, but it's also lending to the SME sector. Which is often identified as a major, well, probably the top hurdle for entrepreneurs and small to medium-sized business owners in this region is access to financing, access to a loan when they need it. So that's that's also an interesting play. Indeed, indeed. And the banks here traditionally might have somewhat of a more reservist appetite mm. to uh, servicing and financing SMEs and for good reasons because SMEs need to build up their track record in order for the banks to understand how credit worthy they are. So some of the fintechs that we're seeing in this space are able to perhaps uh, improve their analytics around the credit worthiness of the, of the firm, leveraging on data. There are also fintechs that look at digitizing the processes within the SMEs so that they are able to capture their um, payments records, payment services and history, which actually helps the banks do better analysis of their credit worthiness. Right? And of course, there are simply also those that are offering a marketplace where they bring the buyers and sellers together, bring the borrowers and lenders together. So it's a pretty interesting and exciting space. And for us at ADGM, we also wear a public sector hack uh, in terms of uh, trying to help this segment. Uh, We are now exploring developing a marketplace for SMEs where they can seek financing easier, more conveniently, uh, in the automated process so that there's less friction for them. At the same time, we hope that uh, there will be digital tools available on this platform for the banks to do better credit analytics of the lenders and borrowers. Reputationally, regulation does not have a very good relationship to innovation. Can you talk a bit about leading on a regulatory environment while also creating a space for innovation and a space for entrepreneurs to be building new things? Sure. It is always Very difficult to find that balance. Um, But I think there are two things that you must always be mindful of uh, in terms of having good governance around such uh, decisions. And and one, of course, is to hire the right people with the capabilities and knowledge to understand the risk and make good judgment calls. So we are pretty grateful that uh, we are able to tap on talents from all over the world, from major jurisdictions, from the UK, from Australia, from Singapore, so each of them has different regulatory uh, experience and background, having experienced the sort of developments in those major jurisdictions to bring those expertise in and to make the right judgment calls and to make key decisions around um, how to balance innovation with regulation. So that's talent in the first instance. Secondly, it is really about putting in place the right governance structure within the organization to make those decisions collectively so that uh, we don't uh, rush into certain decisions. Of course, agility will always be key, um, but that in a way comes with uh, our advantage of being able to set up our structure from scratch with no legacy issues, uh, combined with the ability to tap tap on the know-how and experience of regulators from various jurisdictions. Financial technology was the really hot new thing at the start of the 21st century for the sort of the first 20 years of this century, fintech has been growing in relevance and importance to society in our everyday lives. Elon Musk founded PayPal in the late nineties and it's, you know, a real linchpin of what we now know as, as fintech today and online payments. Today, Elon Musk is very pro cryptocurrency. He's bullish on Bitcoin and, uh, you know, he doesn't represent the universe, but as a as a leader on where things are headed, he's seemingly moving away from fintech and into decentralized finance. And this evolution that we're seeing from, you know, just core technologies into DeFi. And then Jack Dorsey, who founded Square, which is a payment platform, has recently announced a decentralized finance strategy for Square. Where would you say we're at in this evolution? Where are we at in even, is fintech still in its infancy? Is there still much road to travel in innovation in fintech before we you know, head over and onto the next shiny thing? What, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? 
Oh, that's a pretty tough question. Um, so if I were to wear my regulator's hat, I'm very excited by the developments in this view, um, not just in fintech, which I think there's still a lot more to grow, um, but the space of digital assets, the space of virtual assets and crypto assets, um, which brings about, depending on the use cases, a lot of potential to improve efficiency, to do things better and even improve regulatory outcomes. Just let me give you an example. Uh, what we are doing now at the ADGM is to explore programming, coding rules and regulations into securities tokens through smart contracts. Right? So that's part of the universe of DeFi. And by doing so, you are able to automate compliance because what happens is that securities token will only be distributed to clients that qualify to invest in such products. You can only deploy it, you can only exchange it if it's actually a valid piece of code. That's right. And also, if that client in the first place is properly onboarded, properly KYC. So his details are inside. So the know your customer. Exactly. So the details of the customer are coded into the, into the asset. That's right. And the asset is worthless if it does not comply with the regulations. Yeah. So the asset cannot be distributed, cannot be sold to the individual if he doesn't meet the KYC requirements. So those processes are automated. In today, most of the, um, how, how the financial institutions do it is they actually do a manual assessment, do a documentation review of that client, verify that it is indeed the person before they sell the product to that individual. Now everything can be automated inside the token. So if that token comes to you and the person does not meet all the um, requirements that's programmed in the tokens, you don't get to receive the token. You don't get to buy into the investments. What would happen in an environment where there is no regulation of these assets you're talking about? From my experience, there will be the bona fide players who believe that uh, such products can really transform and for good. There will also be the other camp where they abuse the system and um, of course um, use the technology for illicit activities. So like, for example, the recent uh, Squid Game cryptocurrency that proved to not be a cryptocurrency at all. It was just a pretty low level uh, fraud and, you know, they just stole people's money. It was very straightforward stealing of individuals' money. Was that because of a lack of regulation, a lack of oversight, or what was the issue there? It is a combination of lack of regulation uh, in the sense that uh, I suppose that falls under an area where it is not really about raising investments or it doesn't fit the definition of a securities in the traditional definition of most regulations. Uh, and the other, of course, is the investors, they do need to understand. And so it comes to the point of uh, investor education, uh, even to a certain extent, certain greed driven by greed that everyone wants to get rich, right? So I think it's a combination of both having sound regulations as well as educating the investors along the way to understand there's no such thing as Free lunch, if, if anything sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. We're starting to see financial institutions actually begin to identify cryptocurrencies as a legitimate asset class. And that could be seen as sort of a mainstreaming of cryptocurrencies. Is that what it signals to you? And when do you think cryptocurrencies will be a mainstream asset? Yes, certainly we are seeing institutional players like the big banks going into cryptos in a big way. Uh, I've seen cases in Singapore, the Developed Bank of Singapore have their own crypto exchanges. JP Morgan have their own coins. Northern Trust, Standard Chart, all coming out with their own institutional grade custody services. So definitely the institutions are seeing the value in terms of uh, what cryptocurrencies can offer. And much of it is also driven by what the clients want. Right? So. I would say currently the applications are more applied to improving the efficiencies within the traditional financial processes. So for example, in the case of JP Morgan, they have their own stable coins where they allow their clients to transfer value money from one jurisdiction to another uh, wholesale client in another jurisdiction or within the closed clientele environment of JP Morgan. So that stablecoin becomes a store of value that is then able to be transferred across borders is what you're saying. That's right. Efficiently and 
definitely real time. So it's yeah, so it becomes a real time transaction rather than having to wait for it to go through the payment gateways, which would slow it down and make it a multi hour or multi day transaction. Cryptocurrency was founded as sort of this wild west, you know, stick it to the man, get away from the regulatory environment, get away from traditional financial services. And now we're seeing it sort of being pulled back by the regulators, by traditional finance and being used as, you know, a real potential high value asset if used correctly. There's huge upside. As you said, there's massive customer demand. It's going mainstream. Do you struggle with that relationship sometimes? Do you think that that maybe is maybe not in the spirit of how how this all got started? I look at it as um, not a a dichotomy between Mm. um, regulations and the will, so-called free will of the people. I see it as regulations enabling it to promote adoption and perhaps accelerate uh, the deployment of the original intention of the asset. So in this case, not everyone will buy into the idea of the original creator, right? So there's the new need to create trust and certainly in terms of what the institutional players are looking for, they don't have that comfort of exploring that instrument without proper regulations. There's a reason why the illicit players do make use of blockchain for the anonymity uh, to, to carry out their activities. So what we're trying to do is shine a light in the right place that was uh, Kelsey speaking to Y Lum Kwok from the ADGM about uh, cryptocurrencies, decentralized finance, um, you know, all the developments in 2021. Sure. So ADGM, the reason I wanted to speak to him was because ADGM, since it started in 2015, has been on the bleeding edge of attempting to regulate the infrastructure and the companies that are supplying us with this crypto future. So I think it's always interesting to talk to these people who are kind of building the road as we're driving down it, and he's certainly one of them. Just to clarify, the ADGM isn't regulating sort of the the coins, if you like, the Bitcoins or the Doge coins or the Ether. Um, what they're doing is creating an infra- well, an environment for the infrastructure around what is expected to be, you know, a growth industry of people either wanting to, you know, issue non fungible tokens or to issue. Uh, you know, their own cryptocurrency or to be an exchange uh, or whatever other businesses are related to blockchain and, and other things, they want to create that environment for them to operate out of Abu Dhabi. Right. So come set up your business here and also we'll shine a light on, you know, safe ways to access these marketplaces by regulating, by creating safe rules of the road so that you can have confidence when you're investing or transacting with one of these companies that they do have the appropriate oversight to, you know, be good stewards of of your cash and to provide in exchange either a good or service. And so we're we're in a brave new world here on all of this. And I think it is it is confusing. I'd like to acknowledge that I often get confused as we talk about this even, but I think we're all in a state of trying to understand because this is only going to proliferate and get, you know, more and more relevant to our everyday lives. So so let me ask you what you think, given that you are the, the national's future editor, you do cover a lot of themes about what literally our future might look like. So if if we equate where we are in the in the in the digital currencies, digital finance space, are we sort of mid nineties? Are we early noughties? You know, where where are we in the cycle? Because it, it isn't necessarily easy to understand, but also it isn't something that's going to be as natural for the everyday person to use, just like dial up internet wasn't easy for the everyday person to use. (laughs) Right. I recently watched a clip of Bill Gates try to explain to David Letterman what the internet was going to be back in the mid-90s. And I do think we're basically having that conversation right now about Web 3.0. And to my mind, this could point to sort of a tragedy of the commons of this is owned by no one. So therefore, no one is ultimately responsible. I think we're seeing that online right now through, you know, the rise of trolls, uh, ransomware attacks, the kind of ever-increasing risk profile of all of our personal data, it feels like a vulnerable moment for all of us on the internet, both as individuals and also as a wider society. So I'm skeptical that Web 3.0 is our answer. As I said earlier, this could be a tragedy of the commons situation, but also it seems like we're really hungry right now for a more humanist approach. And so some of this is kind of wishful thinking or wishful wishful buying even when you think about how much investment's being poured into cryptocurrencies right now. Um, 
but as the cynic side of me says, look what Meta did, what what the, the artist formerly known as Facebook did earlier this year with the land grab around the metaverse and them saying, you know, we're going to be part of this Web 3.0 future. The big guys are going to be at the table too. Um, so this idea that this is going to solve all of our big, big headaches and our big problems, wishful thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm, I'm skeptical. I mean, philosophically, the, the developments of this technology relates to blockchain um, and cryptocurrencies is so different than, you know, Web 2.0 and the proliferation of social media platforms, for example, because that was about the concentration of our daily use of the internet in the hands of a few companies. While the whole idea, you know, I mean, Bitcoin was always an experiment, for example, in how to create peer-to-peer, um, you know, financial transactions when you didn't need to use a third party and also in a situation where you don't have to trust anybody. You, you know, you don't have to assume that vulnerability. The system assumes that you can't trust anybody and so it's robust enough and uh, transparent enough that you don't need to, and, but yet we can still have transactions processed. So the, you know, this is where we're heading to. We're heading to a point where actually the individual should have control of their digital lives. And when we mean control, if we think about our actual physical lives, often that comes down to our financial situation. It's a conversation that feels littered with paradox and just like, like we can't get away from the paradox. Because what we're talking about is anonymity combined with accountability. We're looking for something that's decentralized, and yet we want to own it. It's not that it's anonymous, because you can, you can see who's on the blockchain, but, but it's private, or, or it's... Or it's, it's um, uh, right? It, so, it, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's radical transparency mixed with you know, high, prote- high levels of protection. So I guess on my Christmas wish list for what, we, what I would really want, not out of Web 3.0, but just out of the internet in general, is a more robust marketplace for personal data. I think every industry from healthcare to financial services to education is hungry for this idea that your personal data is actually worth something. And it's worth something not only to big tech, but it's worth something to you as an individual. And I would really like to see this idea of a marketplace for our own personal data take shape rather than kind of this jargon salad that we're currently in. I think that'd be a really practical first step. Well, I, I think the, the biggest problem of the internet, and it really accelerated with the rise of the big, the big tech companies like Google, is this idea that everything's free. And then we've suddenly found out that, oh, the cliches are alive and well, you know, no such thing as a free lunch. While this, this sort of new, this sort of digital future, whether you're talking about the metaverse or cryptocurrencies or anything else, is where finally there will, there will have to be payment for the data for the time that you've you've spent on a particular platform, a t- particular world, um, it's it's not assumed that you will just hand this all over for nothing. Sure, and this is where NFTs get exciting, is because individuals can then own NFTs and you can tokenize your own data. And now we're actually getting into an economy, we're getting into a marketplace, and there is some social good benefit to the idea of being able to sell your personal data for, say, a public health research project or you know, any number of possible good applications that are separate from this, you know, death of democracy, troll mongering internet that it feels like we're currently in where none of us own really anything, least of all our own personal data. Well, I, I, I like if I look at the experience of Facebook, right? The, I mean, people got on Facebook at the beginning was that proximity, you know, the, to be able to be close to people that weren't necessarily physically there. But the payoff was it was in the physical world. So you would connect with people and you'd, you'd have likes, and, and, but it was all about real people doing real things. And then we've obviously seen the, seen the dark side of, of kind of real people doing, <laughs> of, real, you know, of, of, of things getting real, if you like, from what we do digitally. But if we, we look at where we're going in terms of the future and what um, digital, fi- you know, really user-friendly, which we're not there yet, really user-friendly digital financial tools will allow us, it will allow us to get payback digitally from what we do digitally. It will almost ring fence that experience. And so if I if I use a real a real live example now, um, when I when I watch my kids play Roblox, and they are in Adopt Me, which is a game where you literally adopt a pet, and then you collect pets and you walk around 
and your avatar changes and it, you know it's all about getting rare animals and you're exchanging robux for these things often as well as earning them and there is a connection to the real world because to get robux you need dollars at the moment but also you can earn robux this isn't a plug for roblox by the way <laughs> it's just an illustration um the you can earn those robux by doing doing things in the digital world mm -hmm. so if that if you extrapolate that to whether you're on metaverse or any other platform and you're you're earning things in the digital world and then are able to reward yourself in the digital world then actually it might make life a little bit simpler oh I the gamification sounds good. I'm happy for your kids, but I really hope that they're also walking your dog jelly on a regular basis. And they are not. <laughs> but, that, but, but my parenting skills are not are not are not about the future. At the no, moment. but I would really like for people to be able to get outside and experience the real world, and for the technology to underpin those real world experiences and not replace them. And that's what Web 3.0, I think, in its purest best realization, will do. I'm hoping it doesn't plunge us further into wearing Oculuses. And, you know, all yeah. of this. No, I understand this sort of ready player one, um, you know, uh, dystopia where we don't leave the house because we're, we, our lives are too rich uh, online. But actually, I, it's counterintuitive. But, but, I, but I think the, the, the more real it gets online, the more we will appreciate being offline. And, more, and the more offline will actually be more valuable, if you like. At the moment, we're kind of in an area where a lot of lines are blurred. We're online, but we're, we're also doing things offline. And, 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 and things tend to, to kind of get mixed up. When we actually have a real ecosystem on the internet that is self-contained and allows you to, be, to almost have a, a completely different identity online, then offline is almost freedom. Actually. I hope you're right. 2022, here we come. Well, I'm not, I'm not doing any favors for the sci-fi business, let's put it that way, <laughs> which, which tends to trade on we're all doomed but i'm not i'm not sure this year indicates that we are actually doomed and you know everything everything that we've heard on this episode so far you know indicates that it's early early days but there's a lot to potentially be excited about and also have faith that it will all be much much simpler at some point it feels like we're trying to solve incredibly exciting problems and that's a good place to be Kelsey Warner, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. All that remains is to thank our production team, Arthur Edison and Aisha Khan. Do join us again next time. <laughs>